write about it and think about it and decide. I need someone that's going to be in charge of, of, of volunteers. And I'd ask a couple of people, but we're waiting to hear from them. But if you have any desire or think that you could do that, I'd appreciate that you know, letting me know. And as you pray about it and think about it and decide, uh, just let us know. So because we can't start until we have people there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now let me get back on the train of thought here. <laughs> uh, yesterday, yesterday was Veterans Day, and uh, my, my dad served in World War II, and my brother served in Korea. But it's always a special day to me for what our veterans sacrifice so we can be in this house of the Lord right now. That's... Uh, I think it's a, one of the greatest sacrifices ever to serve, serve the country. And uh, I'd just like to personally thank all the veterans that, that's in here and, and worldwide. It's a, it's a great country. Sometimes it, it gets out of kilter sometimes, but uh, these people are service, so we have the right to be in this church is a, a wonderful contribution to the, for their lives. And I'd just like to say thank you to all of you. As no more announcements, uh, let's go to the Lord of Prayer. <coughs> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thank you for all the wonderful gifts of life you give us and all the blessings. For that special blessing you gave us, uh, your Son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to take away our sins and sins of the world. What a gracious, gracious gift that is to have salvation and eternal life, to be in your glorious kingdom of heaven. Do Lord be with all the family members that have veterans and have lost veterans. Uh, be with them and let them know that uh, we are proud of their service that they that they are in. Do Lord be with all that are sick and in need of uh, your healing touch. Do Lord be with the ones that have lost loved ones who recently and still feel their feel their loss uh, as your comes at the of their death, and uh, especially around the, the holiday seasons, uh, it seems like you, you miss family members more when you think back of, of the beautiful times you had together with them. Here will be a Tim, Pastor Tim today as he brings us our message, so let's open our hearts and our minds to, to the Word and spread it out through the community. Now be with us through the rest of the day and the rest of the week. We your Son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
listen to these words that come from Psalm 71, the first three verses. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we come to you this morning acknowledging you as our refuge, as our rock, as our fortress, as our place that we can come to for safety, for well-being, for help. And Lord, as we come to you this morning, we acknowledge that we're sinners. We acknowledge that we have, at times, fallen from the path that you desire for us to walk. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us. That you would help us, not just to feel sorrowful for what we've done, but to turn from it and to turn back to you. That we might receive your forgiveness, your cleansing, your making of us whole again. Lord, what a blessing that is. To know that you are God who loves us and cares for us. And we thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him can we come to you. So Lord, thank you for his willingness to set aside all of his rights and privileges to come here as a baby, to walk as a child, to learn as a young man, and to share with us through many different ways, but most of all, to die on the cross for us. And it's in his resurrection that we know, Lord, one day we also will be bodily resurrected. What a blessing that is to live all eternity with you. Lord, we thank you for our veterans and those who have done so much to make this a country where we can come and worship you the way we feel led. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us to bring us life, to bring us treasure, to bring us peace and grace and love and mercy. May we rest in your warm arms of love at times so that we might know you better and that we might be a better reflection of Jesus Christ in this world. Lord, we have many concerns upon our hearts. And you know each and every one of those that is precious to us. So we ask, Lord, that you take these concerns now. We lift them up to you for each and every situation that we have. And we ask, Lord, that your will be done not ours, but what you know to be the best, what you know to be the most appropriate and the right. Lord, answer our prayers. Guide us now as we use Jesus' words that we may learn how to live these words better. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. I saw on the screen a while ago that we have some folks who going to have a birthday this week. So happy birthday to everyone that's having a birthday. And welcome to our church service this morning. Those who are watching my Facebook, we hope you enjoy this service. And I think we have a visitor with us this morning. It's Jan. <laughs> She has been upstairs. She's been closer to heaven than we have for the last few weeks. But she's back down with us. It's good to see you, honey. That's my right arm. <laughs> Let us stand and sing some songs of praise this morning as we worship our Lord. it so I'm going to don't forget about shoe boxes this week this is the week for collecting them so if you have uh, not brought it in yet uh, please say, take some time to get it to the church this week and we will make sure it gets down to uh, the church of God is it uh, down at the bottom of Cove Hill so um, please get those in this week Today we're looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, uh, the very last verses. You've already heard some of those verses from the beginning of the song. And the reason we put them there at the beginning of the song, because I hope you notice that the song is dealt with believing in the returning of Christ and what will happen when, we, when Christ does come again. So let me read for you, starting in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be there with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, there was a dilemma in the first church. The people in the first church, first century church, were concerned about those who died before Jesus' return. There was full and wonderful expectation when the things were happening that Jesus Christ would come back soon. Now, Jesus was not raised just in spirit. He was also bodily raised. This gives us the full understanding that death does not have victory over us. God has victory over death. We do not serve a Savior who is dead. We do not serve a Savior that has not become alive again. 
And that's a wonderful thing because every other religion in the world serves a dead leader. Every other one serves a dead leader. The one who came to prepare the way for us is alive. Well, people in the church were dying. And Jesus had not returned yet. And so people were getting upset. They were, being, they were worried. They were anxious. What does this mean if Jesus has not come back yet and some of the faithful members have died already? So people in the first century church were concerned about those who died before Jesus' return. What does that mean? Are they lost forever? Are they lost and now gone? Because Jesus has not returned yet. And they have already died. Now, you probably noticed in the scripture that um, just as we use different words when we talk about when somebody died, well, they've gone home. They've passed away. Okay? We use different euphemism words to kind of soften the blow of those who have died. One of the words that's used here in Scripture is those who are asleep. Same thing that Jesus used at times. He said those who are sleeping. Remember, he went about Lazarus, and what did he say about Lazarus? He's sleeping. And the disciples didn't get it, and he said he's died. <laughs> and they said, then why are we bothering to go? Why are you going? And Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus did die a second time. Okay? The resurrection that I'll be talking about is the resurrection where you come back alive and live for all eternity. There's a difference. But you see, the people in the church were concerned. They learned that Jesus was going to come a second time and that Jesus was going to save his church. And those who believe in Jesus Christ, who trust in him, who accept what he did on the cross for them, would also go to live with him for all eternity. But what about those who have died? So Paul writes this pastoral piece to encourage and comfort them. He's concerned about bringing them comfort. He's concerned about encouraging them in the situation that they're in. He doesn't want them to be anxious and upset about those who have died. He wants to bring them a word of encouragement. That's the point of this passage. He wants to bring them a word that says, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't be upset about those who have died. Now, if you pay attention, even as Paul writes this, he feels that he will still be alive when Jesus Christ comes back. Okay? According to the Lord's word, verse 15 we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So Paul fully believes that he's going to be there alive when Jesus Christ comes back. We know today that he is not. That he has died. And tradition tells us that he died in Rome. What does this mean when Paul believes that he was going to still be alive when Christ comes? There's a lot of emphasis in our world and there's a lot of emphasis among Christians about studying the end times and trying to figure out the end times. I remember the time that one lady told me, she said, I feel very sure that God has instructed me to find out exactly how the end times will happen and when it will happen. And I looked at her and I said, well, then I guess you don't read scripture. 
Because Jesus told the disciples two different things about the end times. Number one, he told them it's not for them to know, and even he did not know when the end time was going to happen. So here's the first thing for you. If anyone ever comes and tells you exactly when the second coming of Christ is going to be, stop believing them right there. Because Jesus said, no one knows, not even me, only the Father. So if anybody ever tells you exactly when Jesus Christ is coming back, you know that they're not telling you the truth. You know that from the very beginning. The second thing that Jesus always told his disciples when they worried about the end times, he told them in Acts chapter 1, that's not for you to worry about. That's not for you to be concerned about. What I want you to be worried about is spreading the word of Jesus Christ throughout this world. That's what our emphasis should be. And every time that the disciples asked about it, Jesus always turned their attention to building the kingdom of God, to making disciples, to reaching out to bring new people to Christ. He always turned them. So here's what I want to tell you. You don't have to figure out the end times. You don't have to know when it's going to happen. You don't even have to know the signs for when it's going to happen. You don't need to know any of that. You need to be busy about growing spiritually yourself and reaching out, bringing other people to Jesus Christ, building the kingdom of God. That should be our biggest concern not figuring the end times out. And, and I'll, I'll step aside a little bit and I'll tell you this. I pray for the end times not to come. Not to come. Because there are people out there who need an opportunity to still decide to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I ask God to give them as much time as possible. Now, as I've shared this with other folks, some people, some church folks have looked at me and they have said, well, they've had enough time. Here's what I want to tell you. I'm glad that God didn't think 17 years was enough time for me to have. Because it took until the 18th or the 19th year until I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I'm glad that God gave me all that time to finally come to that place. And I know some people who still need time. So I do not pray for the second coming to happen any time soon. Now, there are those out there that have told me, well, look at the wars that are happening. I know the end time is just around the corner. Obviously, they don't understand what Jesus said. Because Jesus said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, the end time is not yet. Right? Right? So we're hearing about wars and rumors of wars in our news. That means the end time is not yet. If you read carefully, Scripture says there will be a time of great peace before the end time. When the Antichrist comes, there will be a time of worldwide great peace. And then that's when the end will happen. As long as you hear about wars and rumors of wars, not yet. Not yet. But see, in the first church, they were concerned. What about these people who have died? They're not here to be caught up with Jesus Christ when he comes back. So Paul writes this words of encouragement. And he tells them that those who died before Jesus' return will precede those who are still living at Jesus' return. 
If Jesus' return happens this afternoon, we will see those who have died in Jesus resurrected first before we are. So until you see people coming up out of the graves, bodily, not just spirit or soul, bodily, it's not yet. And I've never seen that happen. I've been in plenty of graveyards. And I've never seen that happen yet. Those who have died will be bodily resurrected first. First. And they will be caught up in the air. And then those who are still living will follow them. We don't go first if we're still alive. Those who have died go first. And it says that we will all meet together in the air and have a celebration. You know what the, one of the exciting things about this is? In Paul's day, they believed that the evil spirits had control of the air above the earth. Jesus Christ is coming. And is going to inhabit that air above the earth with all the believers. First, those who have died, and then those who are still alive, and we will have a celebration in that air that the, the Greeks always thought about. That's the place where the evil spirits live. So basically, we're going to have a party in their space. And Jesus is going to show, I have power over them. We're having a party in their house before we go to heaven. Now, this word, I want you to understand something, because this is hard. This word is not so much a diagram of how it happens, but a word that helps people have hope. The main purpose for Paul writing this word was to give people hope. Not to explain the formula, the diagram for exactly how every detail works. It was about giving people hope. And letting people know that even those who have died will be bodily resurrected with Jesus Christ. You can have hope. I think of one lady that I discipled and never could understand why she died. She was a wonderful disciple and reached out to lots of folks and brought lots of people into the kingdom and she just soaked up the Bible and wanted to learn it more and wanted to understand it more and wanted to bring that to people. And she died. And my first thoughts were, Lord, why? Here is a wonderful individual that's doing exactly what you have asked. And she died at a young age. I believe she was in her 30s when she died. She wasn't supposed to live to age 18. She had a congenital heart defect. They thought that she had bipolar problems and then they found out she had a tumor in her brain that was causing that to happen. They went in and took that out. She reached out to people. She brought people to the kingdom. And I said, Lord, why did you call her home so early? And I went to her funeral. And the incredible number of young people that were at her funeral who had come to know Jesus Christ because of what Susan had shared with them and what she reached out to them with. And I stood there at the funeral and I watched how people celebrated the fact that they knew that she would be bodily resurrected. And that they knew that she would live for all eternity there was no 
lostness about this. Oh Lord, why is she gone? They were excited about the fact because they had this hope and they knew what would happen to her. They knew it beyond the shadow of a doubt. Yes, there were tears. Yes, there was crying. But these people knew. I was not the pastor that did the funeral. I was able to stand at a distance and watch this whole thing. And it just amazed me. Knowing how these people had this hope that Paul was trying to bring to the people. Your loved ones who have died in Christ will be bodily resurrected. Now, Scripture never explains about that. I've had people come and ask me, Pastor, is it all right to be cremated? And I'm like, it's the family who's left that has to live with it. I think you need to ask them, can they live with it? Would it be okay with them? Because I know the God that I know and the God that I serve can put back together anybody, no matter what happens to it, to resurrect it. No matter what happens. Because if you're going to tell me I'm cremated and I can't be resurrected bodily, then what happens to the people that burn up in a fire who believe in Jesus Christ? What a choice they made. What happens to those in, a, in an airplane crash? I believe that God can put all those bodies back together and resurrect them as whole again. Amen? Amen. I believe that God will resurrect them and that they will walk again. Now, I'm hoping that it's not with a catch in my knees still. I have some doubts on that because Jesus' wounds still existed after he was resurrected. Not to bring you a sad fact, but Jesus' wounds were still there. Thomas, come and put your fingers in the holes. Reach into my side. You see, Paul's trying to bring them a word of encouragement. And what does he say at the end of this passage? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Bring these words to other people who have lost loved ones. Encourage them. Lift them up. And say, if your loved one believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will be bodily resurrected. Not just the spirit. Not just the soul. Bodily resurrected. Amen? Amen? What a wonderful thing. So it's not so much a diagram. We try to make a diagram out of it. And we try to, to line it all out and graph it out and draw an illustration and say, this is exactly how it happens. I, I've come to the place in my life, I was reading a commentary one time on the end times. And, and I've heard of amillennialism, premillennialism, midmillennialism, postmillennialism. And if you haven't heard of those and you want to, I can sit down and, and put you to sleep describing every one of them to you if that's what you want. Okay? And if you need me to make a tape, I'll make a tape. And that way, if you have problems sleeping at home, you can turn it on and listen to it. And this guy said that he was a panmillennialist. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. We studied all this stuff in Scripture, and I never heard anything about a pan-millennialist. What in the world does that mean? So I kept reading. And he basically said this, and this is what, exactly what I believe. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter how I got it figured out. It's all going to pan out in the end. If I've got it figured out wrong, that's not whether I get into heaven or not. 
That's not the question when you get to the pearly gates. Did you have the end times figured out right? And by the way, if you've got it figured out right, please let me know. Because I've been studying it for years. And Scripture has a multitude of voices about it. We looked, um, was it last weekend, guys? We looked at the parable of the wheat and the weeds. You know, we believe and we teach in the church many times that the people will be raptured. The church will be raptured. First off, let me say that listen very carefully to what I'm getting ready to say. The word rapture never appears in Scripture. That word is never used in Scripture. Now, the concept of the rapture comes from this passage we've read today. But I hope you realize you never heard me read, read that word, did you? That's what I'm saying. That word does not exist in the Scriptures. Not at all. We studied about the weeds and the wheat. And as Jesus tells that parable, he says that the weeds are the kingdom of heaven, or the wheat is the kingdom of heaven, and the weeds are sowed by the evil one. And he says at the end of time, the angels will come and first take the weeds and burn them up. And then the wheat. I know, that's different than what you've been taught all your church life. You've been taught that the church is taken first and everybody else is left behind, right? That's not how Jesus shares it. He says that the weeds, the weeds get gathered up first and destroyed before the wheat is taken up. So there's a multitude of voices in Scripture. Paul just wanted to bring to these folks a word of hope. Guys, don't worry about this. Because if I get worried about, well, my loved one has died and Christ has not come back, does that mean that they will still be resurrected? And I get worried about that and concerned about that and thinking about that with all of my time, then I will not spend time talking to other people about coming to Jesus Christ. Because I've spent all my time worrying about my loved one that if I know they believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to heaven. They will be bodily resurrected. So we live as people with hope who know that all believers will be resurrected at Jesus' second coming. All believers, whether they've died, whether they're alive. That's why it's very important that you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And I, I want to emphasize both of those things. Because a lot of people, I believe, come to Jesus Christ and want a Savior so that they don't go to hell. But very few Christians come and want a Lord. Very few people come and want to say, Lord, whatever you say, I will do. Whatever you want me to participate in, I will take part in. For me, it took me many years to make Jesus my Lord. It took me over seven years to make Jesus my Lord after accepting Him as my Savior. And when I said, you're my Lord, I then said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. Whether I want to or not, I will do it. Whether I think it's easy or not, I will do it. If it's outside my comfort zone, and Lord, you asked me to do it, I will do it. And because of that, I know that I will be bodily resurrected. I know it. 
Whether I'm dead or alive, when Jesus Christ comes again, I will meet in the air and be part of that great and incredible celebration. And I can't wait for it because I get to see people that led me to Christ. I get to see Jack Giuliano, a wonderful old little Italian man that taught me what it meant to love people in a very humble and a very easy way. I was director of the men's group that at that time. He was the secretary, and one of the things that the director of the men's group did was wrote birthday cards to every man in the church on their birthday. He would come to me with these cards saying, Tim, we need to write these birthday cards. And I told him, I said, you know, Jack, if some Wednesday night we don't catch up with each other, it's okay if you just sign my name for me. And he looked at me and said, I'll never do it. It needs your personal touch to show these people how much you care about them. And I still write cards. And I still write letters. Not typed. And not email sometimes. I write them out. Because of a man named Jack Giuliano. And I can't wait to see him again. Because I never got to tell him goodbye. I was out of town. He went into the hospital. And when I came back in town, only family could go in to visit with him. And he died. I can't wait to meet Jack in the air again. The celebration with that little short Italian man. <laughs> How wonderful that's going to be. How incredibly wonderful that is going to be. He's been dead for almost 30 years now. But God is going to bodily resurrect him to meet in the air. And I'll get to watch him go first. And then I'll get to join him and hug him. And tell him, thank you, Jack, for teaching me how to love people. I mean, what a wonderful man. There are others, and you have some too. But what I want to ask you to think about, with whom can you share this encouraging word about the great celebration in the air? Who do you know that has lost a loved one who believed in Jesus Christ? Who do you know that needs this encouraging word? It's not a word about scaring people into accepting Christ or you won't get resurrected. It's a word about encouraging folks. That's what Paul says. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Who do you know that needs to hear these words? And then I'm going to ask you, are you going to do something about it this week? Before we meet again on Sunday, are you going to do something about it? And bring them this encouraging word that they need to hear. Let's pray. Lord, you know how much our hearts hurt because we've lost loved ones. Lord, you know that as times and seasons come again and again, the hurt feels fresh. Lord, help us to take this word, this word of incredible hope, and to trust very deeply in it ourselves. And then to bring this word to other people who need to hear it. Who need to experience it. Who need to trust in it. That they might have hope. And live their life with joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Maybe you need to step forward. Maybe there's something you need to confess. Maybe there's a word of prayer you need to ask for. You might need to join this church or accept Jesus Christ. Because only if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord will you be part of that celebration in the air. As we stand together and sing, maybe you need to come forward and I'll be here to receive you and pray with you.